Good morning. Good. There we are. Good morning, FAC. How are you guys doing today? All right. Some of us are awake. That's very good news. I'm so glad to hear it. Hey, if we have not met, my name is Wayne Richards. I'm one of the pastors on staff here. So nice to meet you. If we haven't met, all right, good. You're waving. All right, we're definitely awake. This is good. Hey, if you are new here this morning, we want to welcome you. We're excited that you're here. Uh, if you would, uh, take a moment and just text new to FAC at the number that you see on the screen behind me. Just let us know a little bit about yourself. We want to let you know a little bit about us. We're not going to harass you or call you late at night or anything weird like that, but we would love to get to know you a little bit and welcome you. We also have something for you. So if you are new and you haven't stopped in our uh, welcome center there in the breezeway, please be sure to do that as well. We have something we want to give you. And then also for, for, the, for family, for those that are here all the time, you guys know what to do with these, right? If you've invited somebody or had a gospel conversation with someone in the past week or so, we want you to write those names down and drop them in the foyer there so that we can celebrate along with you. That's pretty exciting. But hey, also, if you're new this morning, we want to let you know we're going to be worshiping together for about the next hour and 10 minutes or so. This would be a great time for all of us maybe to put our cell phones on silent or airplane mode, even better, so nobody bugs you. But we would just, uh, we'd love to just engage this next hour and 10 minutes with you and worship the Lord together. So you guys ready for that? Are you sure? Because you don't sound very ready for that. Are you ready for that? All right, all right. Well, let's stand up and worship together then.
Hey, would you mind just taking a seat for just a moment? So this is that part of the service where, uh, where someone comes out and talks to you. And normally when I come out and I talk to you guys at this time, I'm sharing some amazing things that God's doing, right? And, and I was thinking leading up to this week, you know, I really should just come out and share a devotional thought, you know, just something that God's put on my heart. And, and so that was my plan coming in, but then God was like, no, I'm going to show off again this week. And so I need you to share some stuff, okay? So y'all, you need to know this. As of this moment right now, there are six college students that this church has sent out. And they have been in five different countries across three different continents 
sharing the gospel with others. Yeah. I heard, I heard a report back from one of them that says she had opportunity to share the gospel with 22 individual people. And yeah, and so that was pretty awesome. Uh, then we have also, uh, we have 50, 50 children and youth that are going to be headed off to camp this summer. And they're going to grow in their faith. And they're going to be able to reach their, they're going to be better equipped to reach their friends with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I want you to know that those students are going at a minimum of half the cost in very large part because of your extravagant generosity. Yeah, yeah. Then, then we have 30 students that are headed to Life Conference this summer. Their cost has also been cut in half and, and it's a very significant cost. This, this conference happens every three years. It's about 5,000 students from all over the country come and it is a spiritually transformative experience for students. In fact, I have had conversations with no less than a dozen Alliance pastors. One of them is in this room right now who's told me that when they were young in middle or high school, they went to Life Conference and that's where they received their call into the ministry. We have 30, over 30 students that are going to be heading out for that. We're pretty excited about that. We also have four students that are going to be headed to Lakeland, Florida this summer for a conference called Christian Youth in Action. They're going to be trained in how to share the gospel, how to more effectively, how to evangelize specifically with children. And then when they come back to our area, they're going to be having five-day clubs where they're going to invite children from our neighborhood in to come in and, and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's amazing. But y'all, I'm not even close to being finished. On top of that, one of our student small groups, our 10th grade girls, are going to be heading to Clarkston, Georgia this summer on a short-term mission. Clarkston has been called the Ellis Island of the South and the most diverse square mile in the United States of America as far as population goes. And these students are going to be taking the gospel to people that are from countries where a missionary would never, ever be allowed across the border. They're going to be sharing the gospel with those people. That is amazing. All of these things are happening in part because of your extravagant generosity. God has moved in the hearts of many of you to give and make these things possible. And here's one of the coolest things. Okay, I want to tell you this. Last week, I found out one of those six missionaries that we talked about, I found out at the last minute after we had already fully funded the other five and I had even told somebody, hey, you're giving too much. I, we don't need this much. They're fully funded. I found out about a need from a sixth student and it was a significant need. And, I'm, and this is, was just last week, last Sunday. And I'm, I'm leaving here going, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? God, how are we going to fund this? Who am I going to talk to? Who are some people I can round up? Who was it that offered me too much money? Maybe he'll give some more. And, and, but before I had a chance to do anything, I got a text on my phone and said, hey, Dwayne, do, do you guys have enough money for, for camp? And I was able to say, well, actually, yeah, but there's this other need. Long story short, I gave the phone number to that person, and I got a text about 20 minutes after that and said, hey, it's done. It's taken care of. Y'all. God is good, and he takes what little that we have and what little that we're willing to share and, and give back. And, and he does amazing things with it that are going to ripple, not, not only across the world, but throughout eternity. And I don't know if that doesn't make you excited. I don't, <laughs> I don't know what will. So, hey, thank you. Thank you for your extravagant generosity. Thank you for being willing to, uh, to give and to send. Um, it's an amazing thing. So with that, I want to just share with you how you can do that. Uh, if, you, uh, if, if you haven't been with us before, there are ways to give. The seat pocket in front of you has envelopes. If you want to do kind of a more traditional way, you can drop those in the boxes in the corner of our foyer on the way out if you'd like. Or you can give online or by text. There are some instructions on the screen behind me. But would you bow your heads in prayer as we ask the Lord's blessing on the offering this morning? Father, uh, it is a just amazing uh, mind-bending sometimes to see the way that you work, Lord. When, when we see uh, big uh, barriers and, and, and big things in the way, God, you, you, just, you just see something that's just a stepping stone. And so, God, thank you that you provide, that you come through, Lord, and that you give us an opportunity to be a part of what you're doing, Lord. What a blessing it is. And so I pray that you would bless this offering today, Lord. I pray that you would bless every giver and the rest of this service, Lord. And we just thank you for your presence here today. In Jesus' name, amen.
Hey guys, won't you stand and let's continue worshiping together.
every one of us individually you pour into each of our lives and you love us so much help us to realize that you are the only one who can satisfy us you are the only one who can fill us nothing else help us to realize that, that there is nothing that can fill the void in our hearts besides you you are our purpose in life God help us to find that in you to trust in you and to live more like you each day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So grateful that we have the opportunity to just be captivated by, to, to bask in his love this morning. Amen. Amen. And that is, that's our prayer and our heart's desire as we continue in a series that we began last week. Uh, this series out of Exodus chapter um, Exodus chapter 20. So if you've got a Bible, you can turn there. But uh, the whole idea is that as we have walked through, or as we've begun to walk through uh, this passage, what we know as the Ten Commandments, that we would discover the depths of of God's love, that it wouldn't just be these rules and regulations, right? That that hopefully we can begin to get a better picture of of God's heart for us in these words as they were first given to the nation of Israel and as they were given for our good, for our benefit as well. And, And once more, the reminder here is that we're hoping to discover, our aim is to discover the blessing in the boundary, right? It's to discover the blessing within these boundaries. Because if you're anything like me, as you read these words in Exodus chapter 20, as you come across those, at times they can feel, at the very least, stern, right? Like God's making these very clear-cut declarative statements of, this is how it's going to be. And so at the very least, at times we can read these and they feel stern, maybe, maybe even harsh. But perhaps this, this would serve to help us uh, navigate these as we walk through. I, I've witnessed this before. I, I'm guilty of having done this before. Maybe you as a father or as a parent, you can relate to this. Or maybe you can relate to this. Maybe you grew up in a household where, where you felt this a lot of times, but Have you ever engaged in a moment or or witnessed an occasion where something transpired and a father seemed to just be unnecessarily harsh toward their child? Or maybe you experienced that. Maybe that was your home growing up. You you, you know what I'm talking about. It can be as simple as I've seen it in public before. I know you have at a restaurant and, and a child knocks over a a small plastic cup with a little bit of water and the reaction immediately turns what are you doing what's wrong with you why would you do that we find ourselves going golly that that's a little intense like what that where's that coming from what is that all about and and the harshness comes and, and there's no good reason behind it but on the flip side Maybe you've had this occurrence before. or Maybe you yourself have walked this out before. I can remember when we first moved down here, um, we were 
all set, squared away. I was washing or, or emptying some dishes on one occasion. Uh, Michelle was getting the house all set. And I went to grab one of the glasses that wasn't, it wasn't quite dry coming out of the washer afterwards. And it, I picked it up and it just slipped right out of my hands. And y'all know what happens when you drop a glass on a hard tile floor, Right? Just an explosion of glass everywhere, all over the place. It was all over the kitchen. It had shot around the corner a little bit. I just looked at it and I went, well, there you go, Nate. Way to go. Now you got to clean this mess up. Uh, So I went, I grabbed a dustpan and a broom, and I went to start cleaning it. No big deal. I was down there taking care of things in this area by myself. And I heard one of my youngest sets of footsteps come flying down the stairs And then I heard that pitter-patter come around the corner. And immediately, my response was, no, stop right where you are. Don't go any further. And I got around the corner to find my baby girl on the verge of tears. Just in full-on panic, I said, it's okay, baby. It's all right. Daddy's not upset, but there's something in there that could hurt you. And I needed to stop you. So in the moment, words that seemed harsh and and, and seemed a bit too much were in fact delivered to her for her good. That's the hope that we have as we walk through these. They're harsh. You read them and it's like, wow, God wasn't messing around. You're exactly right. He wasn't messing around. But it's because he wanted us to discover his heart for us. So last week, we talked about why study these old, dusty, archaic, busted up, thousands of years old commandments. Why in the world would we study these? And we landed on this. The reason that we dive into these, that we commit them to heart, and more importantly, that we live them out for our own good, for the good of generations that follow us, is to reestablish an absolute standard for living. To come back to a place where we recognize that there are some things God has said that we shouldn't do, and we shouldn't do them because he said so. And there's some things we should do, and we should do them because he said so. That he sets that standard. We saw that it reminds us of our deep need for him. That we can't do this apart from a relationship with a creator God. And ultimately, it's to reveal his desire to love and to bless us. So today, we're going to dive in, and we're going to look at the first few of these commandments. We're going to kind of take the first two commandments and and let them uh, complement and run alongside of each other this morning. So again, Exodus chapter 20 is where we are. If you're there, go ahead and say, I got it, Nate. If not, you can catch up with us, Exodus 20. Uh, But worst case scenario, we'll have it right here on the screen for you so you can read along. You at home, be sure to join us. Uh, We're glad that you're there. So Exodus 20, and let's read a little bit just as a refresher, and we'll be revisiting these uh, throughout the morning. It says this in verse 1, And God spoke all these words, starting by saying, I am the Lord your God. Don't forget it. I speak You listen, okay? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Here's commandment one. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other gods before me. Plainly stated. Doesn't ask any questions. Doesn't give a whole lot of detail. Just says, that's it. Number two. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or a graven image. And now he gives a little bit uh, of explanation. He expounds a bit. Or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, that is in earth beneath, that is in water under the sea. He covers all of them. He's like, hey, anything you can come up with, anything you can imagine, don't make a graven or carved image out of that to set your hearts upon. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commands. So here we have it. We start diving into these today. We get to see what it was that God said, hey, here are the boundaries. 
And what we get to look at today is this. As he presents these two, you shall have no other gods before me, and you shall not make for yourself a carved image. We get to see the boundary, and we get to see the blessing within that boundary. And it starts with this. God desires singular devotion. He sets out this boundary from the very beginning, and the purpose behind it is to say, hey, I want a relationship with you. I'm telling you this because I want to display my heart to you, and I want you to turn your hearts toward me. He desires that singular devotion. Look what he says right right there off the bat. You shall have no other gods before me. Nothing else in the way. Nothing else set up between us. Now again, first glance, this seems intense. And we'll see it a little bit later, but but this would have certainly been the case. It would have been very intense for the nation of Israel as they heard these words. But these words only seem harsh when we view them as strictly restrictive. When we stop with just, you shall not, that's that's when they seem harsh. But if we pause and put these words into their context, the context which they were intended, it changes things. So, what then is the context? God says, you shall have no other gods before me. Well, just before these words, we can read in Exodus 19, the setup for all of this. And in Exodus 19, this is what we find. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, which is pretty cool. In case you missed the memo on that, he straight up said, bloop, and opened up some water. And then he went, bloop, and covered a whole army. I'm not sure there was an actual bloop involved, but I feel like it would have been cool. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you, how I carried you out on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. If you indeed obey my voice and keep my, what is it? covenant. So the context of the command, you shall have no other gods before me, is covenant. The framework is covenant, a promise between these two parties, God, his people. I I look at it like this. Um, A few years ago now, come up here, baby doll. A few years ago now, and when I said, she told me I could say this. I said, I wasn't going to share that because she was, she was a, uh, a youthful bride. But a few years ago, we will celebrate, uh, we just celebrated 25 years together, 22 years of marriage this year, right? Did that give me brownie points? Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, anyway. So 22 years ago, we stood at an altar together uh, with friends and family gathered around in a, a, a building much like this. Uh, our friend and our mentor, Mark Honeycutt, he performed uh, our ceremony. And we stood there together, hand in hand, uh, just like this. And we made some promises to one another. Some vows. We entered into a covenant with one another. I took this this very ring and I placed it on her hand and I looked her in the eyes and I said, I'll cherish you and you only. I'll honor you and you only. You, will I love you, will I give myself to. From now until death parts us. That was the agreement. That was the covenant. After our ceremony, uh, we went over and did the whole wedding thing. And all we wanted to do was just get out of there. Um, I mean, you know. (laughs) 
I'll keep it PG today. In a couple weeks, it's going to get very PG-13, parents. You need to get ready for the adultery week. And if kiddos need to go over there, you should do it. Um, but we got out of there and we headed down to, we were very fortunate, had a sweet family that gifted us for our honeymoon, a beach house that we got to go to down in uh, Cherry Grove, South Carolina, right on the border of North Carolina, South Carolina. And uh, just had an awesome time. About the second or third night, I can't remember, we went out to dinner together. And this is what I know. We sat down to dinner, had a great meal. Uh, honestly, I don't remember what the food was like. But we, we had a good time with one another. <laughs> and this is, this is what's interesting. Now think on this. Uh, ladies, feel free to just, you know, respond how you want to. And men, uh, protect yourselves. If I had sat through that meal, and as we got to the conclusion, that, that waitress came and set down the bill and said, so glad that uh, I could serve you guys tonight. I hope you had a lovely time. If I had turned to her and said, thank you so much. Man, you really took care of us. What a blessing this was. This was great. You seem really sweet too. Like, could I get your number? <laughs> what would have happened? I'll tell you what would have happened. In one week, there would have been one wedding and one funeral. <laughs> that, that's what would have happened, right? And here's the thing. At the very least, it would have been, hold up, wait a minute, put a little smack in it, is what would have happened. And I would have deserved it. Every last bit of it. Why? Because we had a covenant. I, I said it was you, and it's, it's you only. There was an arrangement between the two of us. That's what's going on here. God says, you're going to have no other gods before me. Not to be harsh. To say, I, I desire your devotion. I want to display to you my heart for you. I don't want there to be anything between us. Because anything between us cuts the relationship off. In fact, he was serious about this. If you look at verse five, we saw it just a second ago. Look at what he says. He moves on as he's talking about the graven images and says, you shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. Everybody say jealous. jealous. Type it in online. Say jealous right there. Listen, now, don't get confused by this word, Okay. Because we hear that word and we immediately think, oh, that's a bad thing. God has even said that's a bad thing to be jealous. But please understand, we're not God. All right? And the fact is, for us, jealousy more often than not involves wanting something or someone that isn't ours. When God speaks of his jealousy, he's simply saying, I want what I created to begin with. I want what's mine. I want your devotion. I want your affection. I want that connection with you. And that word that we see in the Hebrew, jealous, is kana. It comes from a root word, which means this, fiery, passionate, zealous. Are you starting to see the blessing instead of the boundary? God is saying, I'm so on fire about us. I'm so passionate about a relationship with my people that I declare to you, I'm a jealous God. And one passage that we see in the Old Testament, it's not just that he says he's a jealous God. He actually says, my name is jealous. Fiery, passionate, zealous for you. In fact, it was a word that was even often used in Hebrew culture to describe the marriage relationship, the intensity a husband had, should have for his bride. See the picture moving on into the New Testament there? A word used to talk about the fiery, intense passion that he has for us. So this jealousy is not simply some high and lofty God saying, I deserve your affection. Which to be clear, he does. Because let's just pause there for a moment. He does deserve your affection. He does deserve your worship, your honor, your loyalty. Plain and simple. Because think about it. Have you ever had someone take credit for your work? How'd you feel about that? 
You don't remember. How many of you remember doing group projects back in school? You remember those? Those were awesome, weren't they? Everybody loved group. Here's what I want to ask. How many of you really, really hated group projects? Raise your hand. Okay. Yeah. We're going to do a sociology experiment right now. How many of you loved group projects? Raise your hand. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, I know what that means. No, I'm just kidding. Listen. You remember getting to the end of that thing and three of you straight up worked your tails off. And then when you got done, Mrs. Smith was like, great job, students. That was fantastic. And then Johnny Knucklehead Johnny McJohnny Pants decides that he wants to say, oh, thanks so much, Mrs. Smith. And you're going, why don't you shut your mouth in the name of Jesus? You didn't do anything. It's to get you, oh. How many of you have you gotten older you, you shared an idea and someone took it as their own. You, you, you built something up, someone took it as their own, right? God deserves our affection because, listen, he was saying, I'm the one who brought you out of Egypt. I am the one who delivered you from bondage. I am the one who parted the seas. I am the one who led you through the wilderness with a pillar of cloud and fire. I'm the one who protected you. I'm the one who provided for you. Don't put something else between us. Because I deserve that. But it's not just jealous God who's simply up there above it all saying, I deserve your affection. He longs for it. He wants that connection with us, which takes us a little bit further. He desires our singular devotion, but God doesn't want us to settle. God desires singular devotion and doesn't want you to settle. That's what this was all about. And yet a pattern that we see over and over in the people of Israel was settling for less than. Time and time again, God would demonstrate his power, his love. God would demonstrate his ability to carry them. And time and time again, they would settle for less than. We do the same. Look at verse 4. What it is that God says, he moves from saying, you shall have no other gods before me. He says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, a graven image, or any likeness. Don't try to create something that doesn't measure up. Now, remember what I said earlier, that these, these words, you shall have no other gods before me, as he starts driving at that, These words would have arrested the attention of the nation of Israel. This wouldn't have been something commonplace to them that they heard. This was unique because these people had been in captivity for some 430 years. Okay? Get that, get that settled in our minds. So, so Leo, we weren't talking about like just lifting you up over the years that you've had and dropping you in, and then you have this assurance of what is right and good and who God is. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a group of people that were already kind of wishy-washy and not quite settled on how this should all work and what a relationship with one true God looks like. Now you pick them up, put them in captivity for 430 years. So we're talking generations that have been in this place called Egypt, which was a hugely polytheistic culture. Lots of gods. We're, we're, We're talking gods for absolutely everything. So Moses bringing down these words to a people who for generations bowed to, prayed to, and worshiped the God of the harvest. Goddess of fertility, a god of the sun. In fact, over 2,000 deities made up the Egyptian pantheon. That's who Moses is bringing these words to. So they hear, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall carve no images. They're going, wait, what? 
We're talking about Isis, Osiris, Amun, Ra, Toph, uh, Anubis, on and on you go. And to each of these Egyptian gods were altars, more specifically images, carved to serve as an object upon which to focus the longings of the human heart. Images that ultimately fell miserably short. Counterfeits. Poor copies of the one true God. I think of it this way. Um, my sweet bride, love, she loves to make cakes. Uh, don't, don't hit her up afterwards and ask her to make one for you, but she loves, she is very talented at it. She's uh, figured out how to make really cool ones over the years for different birthday parties. She made my nephew like this construction cake one time with like trucks on it and dirt being dumped out. And it was just fascinating. She made, for my daughter's birthday one year, she made a 3D owl cake. And it was absolutely amazing. I mean, just really impressive. So anybody who can uh, perform some sort of artistry like that really impresses me. Um, and, and in recent years, more and more people have kind of jumped on this. How many of you have ever seen one of those super realistic looking cakes before, right? And, and, and naturally, it, it makes all of us say, I want to try that. Let me give you an example of one of those cakes. Look at this. Uh, that, is, that is the Snow Queen. That is Elsa from Frozen. That is a cake. Now, I look at that and I just go, how do you even, how do you even cut that? That's amazing because I can't imagine doing that to what looks like a piece of art. What's funny though is being who we are as humans, we see that and we're like, oh, I can do that. Like I'm going to make one. And so where we have this, which is uh, all you could say to that is nailed it, right? What you have is people who try and try and try and instead they failed it. <laughs> I mean, Jenny, I don't even know what that is. I, like, this I get. This, you're trying to scare the children away from the birthday party. That's terrifying. You got Elsa and uh, I don't know. It's just awful. Everything about it. I'm sure they put lots of time and energy into it. And they just shouldn't have. It's just, it's, they tried, but it's not quite. Let me give you another one. Check this out. This one's really cool from the old fairy tale, Rapunzel. So you've got the tower up here. You've got her long flowing blonde hair. Just a really impressive cake. Even got like a dragon over here. It's amazing. Nailed it. And then straight up failed it. I just don't even know. Josh, what is this, brother? I don't know what happened here. It's like somebody was just like, I can do that, and just threw it down. There's not even a dragon. There's just red slop running down the side. And then this last one, I thought, someone saw this one, and just, I mean, again, nailed it. So cute. You got the polar bear and the panda bear, and the, I don't know if that's a grizzly or whatever, but we got the three bears sitting there, and, and someone looked at that and thought, well, that's easy enough. It's just a, a circular cake. And then it's some circles of fondant, you know, put on there and a little bit, maybe some modeling chocolate. I don't know what's going on there, but they got that all set up. Someone's like, yes, I'm going to do that for my baby girl for her birthday. And so they straight up went after it. And I don't, <laughs> I don't tell you, park ranger needs to get some tranquilizer darts for whatever that is. <laughs> Just repulsive. It's terrifying. But here's the thing, as you look at each of those, what, what's interesting is you can see like pieces. When, when, you put, when you put the real deal next to the counterfeit, you can see pieces. You can see glimpses of something that looks like, has a likeness to the real thing. 
You, you can see this attempt, and we laugh at this, but what we see here is something that just doesn't measure up. And yet that's exactly how the nation of Israel had been living. That's exactly how so many of us in this room today, as Christ followers, are living. We're focusing our attention and affection, our efforts and our energy at counterfeits. Something that kind of looks like the real thing. God calls those graven images, those things we set up in that place, he calls those idols. Idol simply defined as an image used as an object of worship, a false god, one that is adored often blindly or excessively. And I love this. An idol is something visible but without substance. Something we can look at and say, that looks good. But will ultimately never satisfy the longings of the human heart. God was saying, don't set these up. Don't place any graven images there. Something that is visible but with no substance. And listen to me. We may not be, as the nation of Israel, a polytheistic uh, group of people who, who believe in multiple gods, and yet we exhibit those same behaviors so many times in life. We set something up as worthy of honor, worthy of our adoration, worthy of our praise, which in fact will never satisfy. We try to make relationships fill a longing that only he can. We, we try to, to, to allow the opinions of men to become the source of our worth. We try to set up a friendship as something to meet a need, a job to give us purpose, material possessions to give us joy, even our children to fill voids in our lives. And the blessing is that God is saying, I don't want you to settle but less than. I don't want you to put anything like that in a place that only I should hold. It's not that those things are bad. I I want to have an amazing marriage. I'm glad I have an amazing marriage. But the moment that I choose to make that of the greatest importance over my relationship and connection with him is the moment both deteriorate. Did you hear what I said? That's the moment both of them break down. It's not bad to have a great job and find some sense of, man, this is great. I'm glad that I'm doing this thing. But listen, the moment that becomes the driving factor is the moment it becomes a poor copy of the one true God. He says, I don't want you to settle. Don't put anything in the place that only I can hold. Finally, he doesn't want us to settle. and He doesn't want us enslaved. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image. At the root of all of this is a God who is saying to us, I don't want you enslaved by what was. In fact, if you actually look at how he starts this whole thing, we can't separate these words. They all flow as one thought from the heart of God to us. If we look at how all this starts before he says, you shall have no other gods, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. He says this in verse one and two. God spoke these words. I am the Lord your God. I brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the, say it with me, house of slavery. The heart of God in this is him saying, I brought you out of slavery. I don't want you to go back. 
I brought you out of chains. I don't want you to go back. I brought you out of bondage. I don't want you to go back. So keep my commands. Keep me close. Keep me first and singular and central. And let me keep you from that. Let me keep you from what enslaved you. You may hear that and you might think just right off the bat, Nate, who, who would want that? Who in the world would want to go back to that, that state of bondage and being enslaved? What's interesting is in the process of Moses trekking up the mountain to hear from God and then back down the mountain to share with the people all that God is asking of them and promising for them. Because see, that's what we have going on here in 19, 20, 21. And and the chapters that follow is this, Moses ascends to go commune with God and hear from him. And he descends back down to share with the people. In the midst of all of that, we come to chapter 32. And in chapter 32, this is what we read. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain. Let me put it in more modern terms. When the people saw that God wasn't responding as quickly as they felt he should. Thank you, Andy. When when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, (laughs) this is great, get up, make us gods who shall go before us. They come to Aaron. They say, Moses is taking too long to come back down and say what God has to say. So Aaron, chop, chop, my good man. Make us a God. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. Clearly, he has fallen off the mountain. Make us a God. So Aaron, tired of their complaining, gives in. And he chooses to compromise to keep the people happy rather than honoring God. Let me just throw this out. You will always have people in your life who question the decisions you make and the path you walk as God calls you to. Don't Step away from that for the sake of keeping someone happy. Because ultimately, as you continue to pursue God, you get the opportunity to point them to holiness. So Moses is up on the mountain. Aaron gives in and he gathers together some of the materials from the people and they make this beauty right here. A big golden a calf for everybody to worship fashion together give us a God that may go before us Aaron says okay and so what we see is that Aaron said to them take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives your sons and your daughters and bring them to me some scholars believe that maybe Aaron was trying to test them and see if they really meant this if they were willing to give up these adornments just so that they could have some image to worship they said okay cool here you go and he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf and they said <laughs> small band of people presents the nation of Israel with a golden cow and they stand before the people and they say what let's say this together they said these are your gods O Israel who brought you up out of the land of Egypt are you kidding me Here we have it. Let's take a moment and just appreciate the enormous irony of the situation. A. Aaron done messed up. <laughs> he, he chose to give in. And please understand, 
Aaron did not randomly choose a golden cow as the perfect image to craft in this situation. It's not as though the people said, man, we need a God. And Aaron was like, oh gosh, whatever, fine. Let me think about this. A cow, yeah, let's do a cow. No, that's not what happened. He didn't just come up with this. In fact, the cow was likely fashioned upon Apis or Hathor. You guessed it. Egyptian gods. The bull in Egyptian culture was a symbol of strength and power and fertility. And in this moment, the people of Israel were patterning their worship of Yahweh after the Egyptians' worship of their gods. More specifically, the children of of God were worshiping an image from their captivity. Who would do that? Author, lecturer, professor R.A. Cole said this of this passage on one occasion. They were a slave people still with the mind of slaves even if God had set them free. I can remember when all of our kids were young. I remember it especially with Benjamin because of the setup of the house where he grew up. When all of our kids were were young, but especially him, uh, we would set up like a, a cruising space. You know, when they start really moving, you remember like there's that period where like rolling over and you're like, oh yeah, that's awesome and then they start really moving and you're going whoa where are you going you're just trying to catch up with them we set up this space and and that house we had like a a coffee table and it sat close enough to the couch that on either end we could kind of barricade it with his with some of his toys set up for him so he could play in that big old space and just enjoy but so that we could keep him safe and laugh and smile and watch we did it with our other two when we moved in to our next house we had kind of a space that was a little bit larger same setup though where we kind of barricaded them in so that they could play and just enjoy life but what was interesting i remember when benjamin got a little more steady and stable we took down those barricades But we took down those things that previously kept him held in. Those things that said, this is it. This is all you get to experience. This is your world. We took those down. And what's funny is we would place the toys back on the floor right there in front of him in that same spot. And even though the barricade was gone, he stayed in the same spot. Why? Because he had been conditioned to not know the freedom of moving beyond what he had previously known. Here in the nation of Israel, God is saying, I want to set you free from the bondage of the past. And here you are running right back to it. Y'all, he had just said, make no graven images. He just said it. He literally told them moments before, hey, don't do this. And they're like, hey, I've got a great idea. Let's make a graven image. (laughs) That'll be good. We don't know where Moses is anyway. Can you imagine God's heart? All the parents said, really? No amen there? You've never had that conversation where you say to your kid, then they do the exact opposite. And you're like, what is wrong with you? I just said this. The heart of God is I don't want you to be enslaved. Please catch this and I'm done. For generations, they had been forced, compelled to worship these images. Now they were choosing to. And how often do we do the same? God doesn't move as quickly as we would like. He doesn't give us the answer on the time frame that we feel that he should. Or he gives us an answer, but it's one that we find ourselves going, that's not what I wanted to hear. And so we turn back 
to the solutions of the past that were in fact nothing more than bondage. Maybe it's as simple as turning back to our own intellect, uh, turning back to old habits. Maybe it's more severe and it's turning back to those old addictions where when we faced the same kind of thing before, we knew the addiction could numb us to the pain. And now because God hasn't shown up in the way that we wanted, we return to our bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. Nothing between us to inhibit our intimacy. You shall make no graven image, any likeness, to hold a place that only I can hold. That's the blessing and the boundary. Amen? So what do we do with that? I want to encourage you, continue to read these daily. Let's have an awkward moment of transparency. How many of you read the Ten Commandments at least once this week? Raise your hand high. How many of you did not read the Ten Commandments at all? Raise your hand high. It's okay. Don't feel judged. He's the one holding up his end of the bargain anyway. You're good. You're not going to hell because you didn't read the Ten Commandments. Good news, right? Hey, I want to challenge you. I know some of you, you're praying, you're doing other devotions, but, but make sure that you're not living from Sunday to Sunday because you can't survive on that. I can promise you, no matter how good the word is that Andy or, or Dwayne or uh, one of our hosts brings during the, the, the time together, the, the, the Steve or who, no matter how good the word is that somebody brings to you, if you're waiting week to week, it's not enough. Number one, it's not going to sustain you. Number two, you're missing out. But I also want to encourage you, even if you are doing some kind of a devotion and prayer, let's connect what we're learning together from week to week and at least read these. Maybe memorize a couple of them each week. I'll ask you again next week and hopefully we'll have a better pass rate. But pray this week, God, are the things in my life I've placed in the position only you can and should hold. Evaluate your attention, your interest, your time, your money, your commitments. Do they start with God? Evaluate what grabs your attention first and fastest. Because I'll just be straight with you. If there's not something inside of us that gets excited about coming together with other believers, it might be that there's a God before him. Amen. Listen, if our first impulse every single morning is to get up and see how many people liked our post from the night before, if that's our first impulse, I'm not saying there is. Pray it out with God. But, but there might be something that we've placed in a place that only he can and should hold. Appreciate the blessing and the boundaries. Father, we love you. We thank you for this time together. Lord, I pray as we leave from this place that the, the prayer in our hearts and on our lips would be, Lord, thank you for your promises. Now empower us to walk in those promises. We love you. We praise you. And together we pray, if there's even one in this room or online who doesn't know you, that today they wouldn't leave without starting a conversation about how they can. God, we thank you. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Listen, before you go shooting out the door, a couple of quick reminders. I do want to remind you, first of all, next week, May the 22nd, we have the opportunity to honor uh, Pastor Tony Huffer and Miss Sherry Huffer as they draw near to Tony's retirement at the end of this month. We'll do something uh, special at the end of each of our services. And then at the end of the day, about one o'clock in the Family Life Center, if you want to stop by and just thank them, we'll have a reception there. And we want you to be a part of that as we just thank them for their years of faithful service to First Alliance Church. And also on the last Sunday of this month, May 29th, 
We have baptism during all of our services. And I want to say this. If you have never taken that step in your faith journey, maybe you just came to know Christ recently, or maybe you've been on this journey with Jesus for 30 years, but you've never made that faith public, we want you to be a part of that day. So sign up today. Sign up out there in the breezeway. Uh, Shoot me a text. Uh, Send something to us online. Whatever the case, we want you to be a part. This is exciting, though. May 29th, get ready for a party. Because last I heard, on May 29th, we are already seeing 17 people step into the baptismal waters. So we are pumped about that. It's going to get rowdy, so get ready. Amen? God bless you guys. Have a great week. We love you.